got your Bibles, turn them to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. We're going to pick up where we left off two weeks ago, there with verse 11. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand, and an usher would love to put one in your hand so that you can follow along. While you're flipping there, real quickly, I'd like to say something. I, I don't get a chance very often to, to say this, but uh, at least, you know, I, actually, I, I've got every week, I guess I want to, but you know, every now and then the Lord just lays it upon my heart to, to tell you that how grateful Denise and I are to be here to be the pastor here at this church, to pastor you. Denise and I love Maricopa. We love Calvary Chapel Maricopa. We love being here. We're dead smack where God wants us, and we're so blessed in, in, in every way. And so I just, I just thank you for, you know, letting me pe- be the pastor. I mean, it, it just it, it is such a blessing. So i uh, just like to start the new year off and by telling the body how much we appreciate you and, and just love being here. It's just a wonderful thing. So... Again, we're sitting here in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. The title of the message is, Perfectly Perfected Forever. And this is speaking about Jesus. Jesus as our mediator and, and high priest in our lives. And, and so I'm real excited. Uh, so we're going to read these verses, and then we're going to look at another section of verses after we do this. So let's pick up in verse 11 of chapter 7 of Hebrews. The author says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest? Should arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change in the law. For he of whom these things are spoken, belonged to another tribe, from which no man has officiated or served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who has come, not according to the law of the flesh, the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of of an endless life. For he testifies, this is Psalm 110, verse 4, or part of it, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitability, unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made uh, was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath, by him who said to him, "The Lord has sworn, and let not, and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant." Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death to, from continuing. But he, speaking of Christ here, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all, when he had offered up himself. For the law appoints as a high priest men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Wow. What a beautiful picture of Christ, our high priest. Now, there's some serious application here. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. I'd like to read something to you in starting off and opening here. 
Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says here, right before the model prayer, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, in the secret place, and and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for their Father knows the things you have Need before you ask him. In this manner, pray. I want to stop there. Can I ask you a question? Who who are the hypocrites and the heathen? Ironically, he's speaking of the priests, according to the order of Aaron. According to the order of Aaron. You see, the Arianic priesthood, all through the Old Testament, had series and times and seasons where they had evil and wicked priests. It's important to understand that God had a greater purpose, and and here it's on display. But then when he talks to his disciples about prayer, look what he says. Pray in this manner. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debtors as we forgive Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Here he's dealing with with his disciples. And what does he do? He takes time to be that mediator. To be that mediator between men and God by teaching them how to pray. Whereas the high priests, by the order of Aaron, were separate. That's a really good analogy as we step into our passage this morning. Our need for a new high priest. Webster defines priest as this, one who, is, who has authority to perform the sacred rites of a religion as mediator between God and man. Well, Christ alone is that, isn't he? You see, this is a really good example, again, of Christ as our mediator. And and he's teaching Jesus to, to, or or Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, to intercede. It's important to understand that this high priest that we're going to talk about this morning is always interceding for us. He's always praying for us. And and what a wonderful thing, if, if we think about that, how that encourages us to be in prayer. If, if, if Christ is, is praying and he's concerned out of love for me and for you, th- doesn't that just change our perspective regarding prayer? It's not like a duty, but it really does become, become communication with God. Galatians 3.19-20 through 20 on the screen says, well, What purpose then does the law serve? Question mark. Paul would say to the Galatian church, It was added because of transgressions. Well, yes. It was added because of sins. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now the mediator does not mediate for one only. But God is one. Guys, this whole idea of God mediating is is a perfect analogy of the Trinity, working within. And we've had a hundred hard time sitting there going, well, how do you explain that? And we go to the scriptures, and, and some people go and look at you like a cow looking at a new gate. I, I don't get it, you know? And, and can I tell you, as I was studying this week, the most powerful demonstration of the Trinity of God and Him interceding in our lives is just that. I see the Trinity at work in you and you, and you, and me, and my wife. Because, because, you see, the Word of God is interceding in my life, and at work in my life. 
The Son of God is praying and interceding and working in my life. The Father is interceding and praying and working in my life. These three are working as one in our lives. Think about what he's done in your life in the past. Think about the things that he's going to do next week. God is at work through the power of the Word, through the power of the Spirit, and through the testimony and work of the Father. It's all through Scripture. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He couldn't be mediator if he wasn't God. Opening our passage, you know, within context of our passage this morning, the author wants the reader to consider just how great Jesus is. as our new high priest in contrast to that Arianic priesthood that's according to the law. You see, they had received it through the law. It was an office of ministry. But it didn't come by oath or by way of a righteous promise, but by way of the Levitical law. But regarding Jesus, one could say rightly that he has become our high priest by the order of God's grace. By God's grace. We're under a new priesthood. We're not under the law. We have a great faithful high priest, a a mediator that's interceding. And before we get into our study again this morning, we have to acknowledge that we're, we're entering a new year right? We're starting a new year. And our desire should be that we draw closer to the Lord in this coming year. We understand him in greater ways, maybe in ways we haven't even understood him before, that we grow in our faith. I hope this passage this morning, right, it it helps you to to understand God in a bigger way, to see him at work in your life in, in a way maybe you haven't seen yet before. To draw closer to him as our faithful high priest. Verse 11 again says this. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under under it the people received the law, what further need is there for another priest that should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not according, right, to the order of Aaron. That, that's the whole idea. There's something new being introduced. Something different. The old was, was in connection to the law. The new priesthood, according to the order of Melchizedek, was according to an endless life. Go back to Genesis 14, remember? Melchizedek was a priest that Aaron came and, and, and tithed to and, and, and all of this stuff, you know? And, and he had no beginning and no end. I would said two weeks ago, that was a theophany. That was a picture of Christ in the Old Testament. So powerful. And we see that on display in our passage this morning. If perfection were through the Levitical priesthood. This, this statement alone shows the need for a, another, a different priesthood, another order. Because it wasn't perfected. No perfection could come through the Levitical priesthood. But we have a perfectly perfected Savior. And he, he, he received this title because he became the sacrifice. He laid down his life. Again, just to remind some of you, this term Levitical priesthood simply describes the Jewish priest or priest order of priesthood in the Old Testament. It came by way of the law and Aaron through Moses. You see, this shows that there's some, there was something lacking in the priesthood to begin with. That priesthood that was according to Aaron, there was something missing because it's in connection to the law. There was something missing in the law. What was it? It was that I never made, no one was ever made perfect in the law. 
It didn't deal on, on, an, on an eternal, forever basis with my sin. It was just simply a covering. Those priests would go into the Holy of Holies once a year and, and offer that once a year sacrifice for the sins of God's people. You know what? I want you to think about this. You know what Jesus, you know what Jesus' holy of holies was? It was that cross. That holy of holies moment was him hanging on that cross. He became the sacrifice and high priest of our salvation. This is powerful. And the passage says, well, what further need was there for another priesthood to, to, to rise up according to the order of Melchizedek? There was a greater need. And we'll see those needs exposed in our passage. You see, under this order of the Levitical priesthood came the law. It was associated with the law. It was associated with Moses. But remember, the priesthood of Melchizedek is associated with Abraham, the father of faith. It's impossible to come to God apart from coming to him by faith. You can't approach God today on the basis of works or the law, can we? We approach him by grace through faith. We're saved. Verse 12 of chapter 7. For the priesthood being changed, comma, make sure you understand the punctuation here, comma, of necessity, there is also a change of the law. The idea here, guys, is if the priesthood has been changed, well, then there's got to be something also changed according to the law. If the priesthood, the Arianic priesthood, never brought any perfection to God's people, then neither did the law because they were, they were, signed, they were one in the same is what the author is saying. And this is logically developed from Psalm 110, verse 4. Now listen, God would never introduce a new priesthood if it wasn't necessary. He would have never completed the law by sending his son if it wasn't greater and necessary. The idea of this necessity Is this, if the priesthood is changed, we should also anticipate some kind of change in the status or place of the law in our lives. Verse 13 and 14, for he, now remember, we're talking about the Arianic priesthood. We're talking about Melchizedek. And he keeps talking about he. It's Jesus. In the very center of the passage, it's just about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Don't miss it. And yet, right? For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe for which no man has officiated or slash served at the altar for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood why because according to the law you couldn't be a priest if you weren't a Levi if you weren't for the tribe of Levi there's no chance I don't care how great you were you weren't going to be a priest we know that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah that was, a, that was a kingly thing. That, that's speaking of, of him being associated to King David. I told you, Hebrews speaks of, G, of Jesus as being prophet, priest, and king. The highest of all prophets. The, the greatest high priest who's done it all and, and the, the king of kings. There's a different order. He wasn't from the tribe of Levi. It's evident is what he's saying. 
No one had ever officiated or served as priest from the tribe of, or any other tribe other than Levi. If he is our high priest, it must be under another principle other than the law. It's under the principle of grace. He is perfectly perfected forever because he became the sacrifice and the high priest of our faith. 15 through 17. And yet it is far more evident if, comma, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come. Not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, speaking of the law, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, this is the testimony, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's the prophecy of the Messiah. Nobody can fulfill this, this testimony. This is the testimony. This is speaking of the Messiah. No one could fulfill this but Jesus. It's not according to the fleshly commandment. The law. But according to the power of an endless life. One might say according to the power that rose Jesus from the grave. He sits in heaven right now at the right hand of the Father. That's what the word tells us. Making intercession and mediating between God and man. You know what I love? I love you. He's praying for me, and I'm praying to him, and, and there's this communication going on, and, and, and it's beautiful. And then on top of that, when the, when the devil decides to come in, if, if I'm really showing off, you know, really living for Jesus, living, getting out there, you know, being religious and all, and the devil decides to show up and accuse me before the Father, Jesus is still interceding. He doesn't stop. He says, you get out of here. That's my son. Hands off. This is the kind of relationship we have with a high priest. Jesus Christ. According to the, the power of an endless life, a forever priesthood. This is, this is so amazing. And this is where I want to remind you. You know what makes heaven heaven? It's not the fact that you think you might get a big old mansion or a crown bigger than your spouse. <laughs> you know, <laughs> heaven's heaven because Jesus is there for no other reason but that it's just, it's just Jesus is there. I don't care if it's got streets of gold or a man. I don't, I don't care. I, I really don't read a lot of those books that tells me what heaven's like. I just know it's great. Because Jesus is there. It's all good. Move on to something greater. Read something more important. It's great. I'm simple-minded. Not according to the fleshly commandment, but upon the power of an endless life. A priest forever. Jesus and his ministry as our high priest is above the law and above the power of death. That's a pretty amazing statement. Again, just playing around with Matthew 27, 1. It's speaking of, of when the, the priests, of course, the, by the order of Aaron, right? Those priests had conspired against Jesus and brought him and delivered him to Pontius Pilate. After beating him, you know all the story, right? Acc falsely accusing him and everything else. Listen, guys, that was that Arianic priesthood that was no good. We were in Israel earlier last year. We had a great guy, Jewish guide, but he wasn't a Messianic Jew. In order to be a guide, you've you got to know the Old and the New Testament. Whether you believe it or not, you better know it upside down because the people you're touring with and leading are New Testament believers in most cases. So on three day three, I, I just about had enough. I, I liked the guy, 
But we were down in the lower city, and, and he, and he kind of kept leaning on the fact, impressing the fact that, that the Jewish priests weren't the ones that killed Jesus and, and delivered it. I'm like, dude, you got it right in front of everybody. I kind of called him out, like, you got to read the New Testament. You know, what are you talking about? Now, I mean, I love Israel. I, I'm pro-Israel, like hardcore. Pro-Israel, right? No replacement theology here. It's pro-Israel. God's got a plan for Israel. And so I'm not talking bad about them at all. But, but it was the high priest and, and his sidekick and the Sanhedrin that did all this. You can't escape that. And that, that just proves their imperfection, their failure. It just proves it. 18 and 19. For on the one hand, you see there's an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect, the author's saying. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. There's an annulling. This word literally means to a, there's an abolishing, there's a cancellation of, or a putting away. Speaking of the law. This is a New Testament church. This is what they're preaching. The disappearance, this is what William Newell said. The disappearance of the law is as absolute as, Therefore, as the putting away of sin. It was as absolute for the law to be put away as it is for Christ to go to the cross and put away our sin. That's crazy. I just got goosebumps. This whole idea of Jesus being our high priest is just awesome. In fact, Hebrews 9.26 on the screen he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the, hand of the, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That is the same word used as annulling in our passage. Putting away. Same Greek word. Why? Because, listen, the law was weak and unprofitable. It, that's what it was in regards to our righteousness. I couldn't reach any kind of right standing with God in that sense. The law made nothing perfect. Now listen, the law did a great job and it served its purpose in setting God's perfect standard before us. But it gave no, no power to keep it. So, so the law is righteous and holy in the fact that it came from God. And he laid it out, but for the sole purpose, as Paul would say in Galatians, that it might be a tutor to lead us to Christ, to show us that we couldn't reach and meet up. I, I look at the law, and I look at God's perfect moral standard for my life, and I go, uh-oh, I'm in deep trouble. I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> uh-oh, well, I guess I'm going down there, not going up there. I'm just not that good because I wasn't raised in church. That's the way most non-churched people think because they think like a law. They don't understand grace because you and I, we're not preaching enough grace. They still see it as a law or as a ritual or some kind of works and not a receiving. It's amazing. William Newell, he was with Moody, if you're wondering who that guy is. Who's this joker? He was with Moody at the turn of the century. Super awesome preacher and evangelist. He said this <clears throat> regarding the passage. I hope it's not offensive, but it's true, so I'm going to say it. Let all legalists mark this. The law made nothing perfect. Let the Seventh-day Adventist mark this. 
the law made nothing perfect. Let all those who dream of the law as a rule of life remember, the law made nothing perfect. But grace did. And we're still dealing with believers who came out of Judaism. They came out of that, that law, that Arianic, ah! And they found faith and love and forgiveness in Christ. And life got hard. And, and so they're wanting to go back. Why on earth would you go back? But can you answer a question for me? I, I've been a Christian for like almost, this Easter will be 30 years. Denise and I have been walking with the Lord. 30 years. And, and I, I, can't, I hate religion. I hate legal, legal's junk. Hate it. Never become one of those. And yet, after 30 years, every now and then, this legalistic thing kind of crawls up in me. And I'm like, where did that come from? Are you with me? You've been a Christian for a long time, and you get all start getting all legalistic. You ever catch yourself going, why am I talking to people like that? I don't even like that. We've got to really guard ourselves from that. We can become all hyper-legalistic, like so easy, especially when we walk with the Lord for a length of time. Because then we start thinking we're all self-righteous, right? We've got a high priest who's died for something more, and he, the work he's doing in our life is not a work of weakness. It's not a work of unprofitableness, but profitableness. The law made nothing perfect. Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. I didn't finish this sermon for service, so you guys are in for it. <clears throat> I'm ripping and roaring. I'm trying to go. I'm, ready. I'm trying to just take the brakes off. Romans 7, one, what does it say? 1 through 6. He says, and I want you to listen closely because he's given you an analogy. Or he says, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if, his husband, if her husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if her if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she, is, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, ah, if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she marry another man. What is he doing? He's using the law in such a way to show us how imperfect it is, because check out what he says in the next verse. Therefore, my brethren, he, that was just all for the purpose of showing you uh, an analogy. Therefore, brethren, you also have become dead to the law, just as that man, if he was dead, she was free, right? So this is the point. He died, she was free from the law. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, <clears throat> that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which, we were, which were aroused in us by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Listen, oh, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He used, he used the law to show them that if you die to the law and live to Christ, you're free from the law. It's crazy. If you're a note taker, you can go back to Galatians 5 and just get all deep into it later today. Listen, the law provides an expertly diagno diagnose uh, of, of, of our sin problem. The law provides an expert di uh, diagnosis our sin problem. Straight up. That's what it does. 
it reveals our need for him. Therefore, the law is absolutely essential and holy and has a purpose, is what the author is saying. But the law does not provide a cure for our sin problem. Only Jesus can save us from our sin problem. This is wonderful. Hmm. Why do we become legalistic? I don't understand. Romans 8, 1 through 5. Do me a favor. I'm going to ask you to desecrate your Bible. I'm reading out of the New King James. The second half of verse 1, I skip because it's not there. They bring up 4 into the bottom half of verse 1. So it really reads like this. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is made free from the law of sin and death. For that, for, excuse me, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the Spirit. Man, is that resonating or what? Here we have this annulling of the former commandment for the purpose of bringing a better hope. That's in context. There's a greater hope, a hope of a high priest, a faithful priest, who is full of for grace and mercy and forgiveness. So every time I blow it, I come back and I go, God, I love you, and I, I'm so sorry I, I blew it. Will you forgive me and repent and go the other way? And God forgives us. So I know. Yeah, it's amazing. You mean I don't have to jump through hoops and hold a set of beads and go find a priest? <laughs> oh, I don't need one. <laughs> I've got a faithful high priest. That's it. I don't need one. I've got a faithful high priest. Why do I, why do I need to go to him? Sorry. I just, right? We understand this. There's a better hope through which we draw near to God because we have a better priesthood and a better high priest. We also have a better hope, a hope in drawing near that draws us near to God. Hope in Jesus, not hope in, in, in the law of Moses or in our ability to keep it. And in as much, he says in verse 20, as he was made priest without an oath, for they became priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus, simply put, Jesus is superior as our high priest by a direct oath or promise of God, spoken directly from God. The Arianic priesthood became priests not by an oath but by a law. 22. We see here Jesus became our guarantee. He became our guarantee. Jesus has become a surety. The Greek word here for surety describes someone who has given security or co-signed a loan. He became a guaranteed down payment. He became our surety. Hebrews 8, 6 says this, but now he has ordained, he has ordained a more excellent ministry or service, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Therefore, a new covenant depends on what Jesus did, not on what we did. He is the surety we're not, nor is the keeping of the law and our ability or disability to do that. But he became so much more this is an overwhelming concept regarding just how superior Jesus is. 
We have a better hope in him. 23. Also, there are many priests. Because, you see, they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever. As I said in the beginning, these Arianic priests, their time in service was limited. But it was also limited because they were just mere mortal men. They, They died. This order of Melchizedek was without end. An endless life. Continues forever. This idea, this statement there, continues forever in the Greek, has the idea of remaining a servant forever. Remaining a servant forever. And it says, and he is also able to save to the uttermost. The unchanging nature of Jesus and his priesthood means that the salvation he gives is also unchangeable. It's secure. Now most people read this verse as if it says Jesus is able to save from the uttermost. But that's wrong. Really the idea is Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. Because he is our high priest forever. And he can continue to save forever. In other words, it's a salvation without end. And those who come to God come through him. Again, he is the mediator between God and man. He continues forever and he lives forever to make intercession for them, for us. It's a wonderful strength to know that Jesus is, is concerned for us and praying for us, making intercession for us. This is something that could never be without, with, with, excuse me, with earthly priests. The priests, according to Arianic, the Arianic priesthood, according to the law, they could never do this. We receive something that in Christ that we could never receive before. Romans 8:34. On the screen, who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen? Who is even at the right hand of God and also makes intercession for us, says Romans 8. So listen to 26 through 28 in closing. For such a high priest was fitting for us or was needed who is holy, harmless, separate from sinners. That means without sin and has become higher than the heavens. Who does not need daily, as those other high priests really, to offer up sacrifices, first for themselves and then for others. He didn't have to do that. For this he did once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints a high priest from men who have weakness. But the word of the oath, that promise, right there from Psalm 110 verse 4. That's what he's speaking of. Which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Can I, can I just stop? I, I got to say this. We, I, I made this statement at Christmas time. Look, when you're talking to people about Jesus and you're talking to them about the Son of God, would you do me a favor and stay biblical and make sure that you're talking about the eternal Son of God? He, 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 wasn't, pre-cre- he wasn't the first creation of God. He is eternal. He's as much God as God. That's what the Scriptures teach. Whether we understand it or not, if you have a problem sharing that, I get that. That's what the Bible teaches from front to back. He's in the eternal Son of God, coexistent, not the first of creation. It's not what it teaches, nowhere. And we've got to be careful, because sometimes when we're talking about Jesus, we're not talking about the same Jesus. We have to speak the truth. That's what the Scriptures teach. Jesus, ultimately, he's qualified to be the high priest. 
He's qualified to rule and to be priest over your life. The question this morning, will you and I submit to his priesthood? Will we submit to his authority? Will we commune with him and fellowship with him? And and as he makes intercession for us, will we also intercede and and pray for others and, 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 and have this prayer relationship with him back? He's exalted. He's perfectly perfected forever. There's never been a man, no matter how great he may seem or the deeds that he may do, that's been great enough to be the high priest that humanity needs. Therefore, he's became the high priest of our faith. He's risen above the heavens, sitting at the right hand of God. He's became everything. Now, check it out. There's so many things in Scripture that tell us who Jesus is. He, he's, he's the good shepherd. And, and those who serve, and, and even men, and you're, you're, you're an under-shepherd. I'm an under I'm not the shepherd. I'm an under-shepherd following the chief shepherd. That's Jesus. Jesus, he, he's the light of the world. Is that not what John says? But in him, we become a city set on a hill. We begin to carry that same light within us. In Scripture, it tells us, uh, tells us men to be priests of our home. I can only do that, and you can only do that when he's the priest of our lives. He's our faithful high priest and mediator between God. You see, there's a biblical order. Be careful that we don't overassert that order. I can't serve God by thinking that I'm equal with God. Right? It's real simple. Real simple. There's a priest in my life. There's a priest in your life. He's a high priest. And this means we don't give honor to anyone other than Jesus in this this fashion. And only Jesus has and continues to carry this role of, as high priest forever. That means this role he'll carry in heaven for all eternity is what this whole chapter is telling us, not just now. And he becomes your high priest one way, and that's by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, making him that Lord and the high priest, giving him that place and that authority in your life. You see, he did the work. Not me, not you. He's done it. The whole, the whole thing, remember, is, it's called the gift of salvation. It's by God's grace. It's not earned. It's not merited. It's simply received. Anything other than that is a false gospel. Doesn't that just blow your mind? I, I, I'll be honest with you. I can meditate on it for hours, and I'm still awkward with it. I am. By very nature, I I, got to do something. God, let me do something. He says, no, you don't do nothing. You just receive me and abide in me. That's it. I've done it all. That's a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, God, that you are faithful, that you're eternal, that you're present, that you're at work in our lives every second of every day, and you're on display in our lives every day. You're on display. The world can see you through us. It's amazing. You're amazing. Lord God, this new year, may we just find it in ourselves to, to let go of some of that legalism that we've, we've kind of picked up along the way and, and, and just come back to you as our faithful high priest, that mediator, and just submit to you. 
and just to turn it over to you and to walk in the Spirit and not try to walk in and to live according to the letter of the law. There's so much freedom in you, Christ. There's so much freedom in you. Sometimes our faith can become stressful in and of itself because we're, we're doing it wrong. God, help us to repent from that and follow hard after you receive your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.